For 6,000 years, one asset was the undisputed king of money. It was durable, scarce, and trusted by civilizations across the globe. It funded empires, disciplined governments, and held its value across millennia. Gold was nearly perfect money, but it had a fatal flaw, a vulnerability that had nothing to do with its chemistry and everything to do with its physics. This single flaw allowed it to be captured, centralized, and ultimately corrupted. That one mistake plunged the world into a 50-year experiment with a new kind of money. Government made money called fiat, an experiment whose consequences are becoming clearer every day. The story of money is a story of evolution, and history doesn't just show us what went wrong. It shows us the precise blueprint for how a new asset can rise to take the throne by learning from gold's one critical error. This is the story of how we get back to the future of money. To understand where we're going, we first have to understand where we came from. We have to ask a question that feels almost childishly simple, yet it's the most profound question in all of finance. What is money? It isn't just wealth. You can be wealthy in land, art, or machinery. But you can't easily use a sliver of a tractor to buy a loaf of bread. Money isn't just wealth. It's the most sellable form of wealth. It's the technology we use to trade our time and talents for the time and talents of others. Throughout history, humanity has tried countless forms of money. We've used shells, salt, cattle, and beads. Each failed for predictable reasons. Cattle die, salt dissolves. Shells are only scarce until you find the next beach. For money to work, it needs a specific set of traits. It has to be durable, divisible, portable, and fungible, meaning one unit is the same as the next. But most importantly, it must be scarce. Its supply must be hard to expand. One element, forged not on Earth, but in the heart of colliding neutron stars, met these criteria better than any other. Gold. Its chemistry means it doesn't rust or tarnish. It's one of the densest metals, so a small amount can hold immense value, making it portable. It's soft and easily measured into coins, and crucially, it's scarce. All the gold ever mined would fit into a cube about 22 meters on each side. Finding and digging it out of the ground requires a tremendous amount of energy and time, what we might today call a proof of work. This wasn't a decision made by some committee. It was a planetary discovery process. From ancient Lydia to Imperial Rome, civilizations separated by vast oceans and thousands of years all independently converged on gold as the ultimate form of money. It was simply the best monetary technology available. The classical gold standard of the 19th century was the peak of this journey. For the first time, the world's major economies were united in a single, stable monetary system. A British pound, a French franc, an American dollar. They were all just different names for a fixed weight of gold. International trade boomed. It wasn't just a system, it was an anchor to reality. A government couldn't just print more money to fund a war or a wasteful project because money was a physical thing that had to be earned or mined. The money supply was governed by physics, not politicians. This era from the late 1800s to 1914 is often called La Belle Epoque, or the Beautiful Era. It was a time of unprecedented global trade, innovation, and relative peace. Prices were stable, savings held their value. People and businesses could plan for the future with a certainty that seems unimaginable today. Gold wasn't just a shiny metal. It was the bedrock of a global economic order, a silent guardian against the temptation of governments to spend money they didn't have. It was honest money. For thousands of years, this system in one form or another worked. It was slow and heavy, but it was trusted. Gold seemed incorruptible. But as our world grew faster and more connected, the very thing that gave gold its value, its physicality, began to reveal itself as a hidden and ultimately fatal flaw. The beautiful era was living on borrowed time. Gold was almost perfect. Almost. Its density made it valuable, but also heavy. Its physicality made it real, but also a real pain to move. Imagine being a 17th century merchant in Amsterdam, needing to settle a large debt in London. You couldn't just wire the money. You had to hire guards and charter a ship to physically haul chests of gold across the sea, braving pirates and storms. It was expensive, risky, and slow. As commerce grew, gold's physical limits became a bottleneck. The solution was ingenious and at first totally innocent, the paper receipt. Goldsmiths had the strongest vaults, so people started storing their gold with them. In return, the goldsmith would issue a paper certificate, a claim check that said, 
This piece of paper is good for one ounce of gold in my vault. Suddenly, that merchant could just hand over the paper receipt. The ownership of the gold changed hands, but the gold itself never moved. It was a revolutionary upgrade, making commerce faster and safer. These paper receipts were the world's first paper money, and they were as good as gold because everyone knew they were fully backed. But this abstraction, separating the claim on the money from the money itself, was where the trouble started. It introduced a new, invisible ingredient, trust. You no longer held the gold. You held a promise for the gold. You had to trust the goldsmith, the custodian, not to get tempted. And this is the fatal flaw, not of gold itself, but of any physical asset in a large-scale society. To be useful for widespread commerce, it must be centralized. You can't have millions of people moving gold bars to buy groceries. The gold has to sit in a few large, trusted vaults, while paper representing it circulates instead. And with centralization comes risk. The moment you hand your gold to someone else, you're no longer in full control of your money. You have a trusted third party. And what does history teach us about trusted third parties? The goldsmiths became the first bankers, and they noticed something fascinating. Most people never came back for their actual gold. They were happy just trading the convenient paper receipts. A clever and deeply tempting idea took root. What if the banker just issued more paper receipts than the gold he held and lent those out at interest? This was the birth of fractional reserve banking. For every ounce of gold in the vault, the banker might create two, five, or ten paper claims. From his perspective, it was incredibly profitable. He could essentially create money from thin air but he had fundamentally corrupted the money. The paper was no longer just a receipt for gold. It was a partially backed fiction. The system only worked as long as everyone didn't ask for their gold back at the same time. When they did, it was called a bank run and the system collapsed. The fatal flaw wasn't the gold. It was the human temptation that centralization enabled. The need to trust a custodian for a physical asset created a single point of failure that proved irresistible. First to the bankers and then to the biggest organization of all, government. Once government saw the power the bankers had claimed, the power to create money, they wanted in. Over centuries, they systematically took over the monetary system. They established central banks and eventually took full control of the vaults. The link between paper money and gold grew weaker and weaker. They promised you could redeem your paper for gold, but they made it harder and harder to do so. The system had been captured. Gold, the incorruptible element, was now a prisoner. The first major break came with World War I. The gold standard made financing large-scale wars difficult. You couldn't just print money to build tanks. You had to have the gold. So the warring nations of Europe suspended the gold standard, promising to return after the war. The printing presses roared to life, and currencies were massively inflated to pay for the conflict. After the war, the world tried to put the system back together, but the trust was gone. Then came the Great Depression. In 1933, President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Executive Order 6102. This order made it illegal for private American citizens to own most gold. The government demanded that citizens turn in their gold to the Federal Reserve for $20.67 in paper per ounce. This was an act of mass confiscation, proving gold's physical vulnerability. Because it was stored in physical locations, the government could seize it. Once the gold was consolidated, Roosevelt promptly revalued it to $35 per ounce, instantly increasing the government's wealth by nearly 70% and stealing that value from every person holding a dollar. This set the stage for the final act. After World War II, the world's leaders met at Bretton Woods and crowned the U.S. dollar the world's reserve currency. Other currencies were pegged to the dollar, and the dollar was supposedly pegged to gold at $35 an ounce. Foreign governments could, in theory, trade their dollars for U.S. gold. But like the bankers of old, the United States couldn't resist temptation. To pay for the Vietnam War and massive social programs, the U.S. printed far more dollars than it had gold to back them. Other countries, like France, grew suspicious and started calling America's bluff, demanding their gold back. The bank run was on. Gold was flowing out of U.S. vaults. On the evening of August 15, 1971, President Richard Nixon appeared on TV and announced he was temporarily suspending the convertibility of the dollar into gold. That temporary suspension is now over 50 years old. 
That was the day the last ghost of real money was exercised from the system. For the first time in history, every single currency on Earth became a fiat currency, money backed by nothing but a government decree. It is backed only by trust in the government that issues it. And what's the result of this 50-year experiment? A world of permanent creeping inflation. It's not that things are getting more expensive, it's that the money you use to buy them is constantly losing value. Depending on the metric used, the US dollar has lost somewhere between 85% and 98% of its purchasing power since 1971. This isn't an accident, it's a feature. It allows governments to pay back enormous debts with cheaper money and to silently tax the savings of their citizens. This system creates punishing boom and bust cycles, a direct result of severing money from its anchor to reality. History had shown we couldn't trust institutions with control over our money. The world desperately needed a new kind of money, one with all the properties of gold, but without that one fatal flaw. What if we could create a money that couldn't be centralized? A money that was pure information, weightless and borderless? What if we could invent digital gold? On October 31st, 2008, in the smoldering ruins of the global financial crisis, a mysterious figure named Satoshi Nakamoto published a nine-page white paper to a small cryptography mailing list. It was titled, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. It was a direct answer to the fatal flaw that had corrupted gold and unleashed the chaos of the fiat system. Satoshi understood the problem perfectly, writing in an early forum post, the root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, but the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. Bitcoin was designed from the ground up to be a system that requires no trust. It does this by brilliantly solving the problems that plagued gold. First, scarcity. Gold is scarce, but if the price goes up, companies will invest more to mine more of it. Bitcoin's scarcity is absolute. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. This is an inviolable mathematical law in the code. While this rule is enforced by network consensus and could theoretically be changed, it's considered so fundamental that doing so is practically impossible. It is the first truly finite asset in human history. Second, portability and divisibility. This was gold's great weakness. Moving it is a hassle. Bitcoin is pure information. You can send a billion dollars worth to the other side of the planet in minutes. It's also perfectly divisible into 100 million smaller units called Satoshis, making it useful for any size transaction. Third, verifiability. Is a gold bar real? You have to trust an expert? How much gold is in a vault? You have to trust auditors. Bitcoin's entire transaction history, the blockchain, is a public ledger. Anyone can run the software and verify every transaction for themselves. It's the embodiment of don't trust verify. But the true genius, the masterstroke that solves gold's fatal flaw, is decentralization. Gold had to be centralized in vaults, making it vulnerable. Bitcoin is the opposite. It doesn't exist in any single location. The network is a web of tens of thousands of computers across the globe, each holding a copy of the ledger. There's no central server to shut down, no headquarters to raid, and no CEO to arrest. This is what makes it seizure resistant. How does a government confiscate an asset secured by a password in your mind? While bitcoins held on centralized exchanges can be and have been seized, self-custodied bitcoin is a different story. They can't repeat Executive Order 6102. This is the solution to capture. For the first time, we have a bare asset that an individual can truly own and control in a digital world. The market is beginning to see this. While gold's market cap is in the range of 15 to 16 trillion dollars, bitcoins fluctuate weights in the 1.1 to 1.4 trillion dollars range. The recent approval of spot Bitcoin ETFs has brought in a wave of institutional interest with these funds now holding tens of billions of dollars in assets. This isn't just speculation. It may be the beginning of a global monetary transition. Bitcoin isn't just a better gold. It's a return to the principles of sound money we lost in 1971. It's a system governed by rules, not rulers. It's a savings technology that can't be debased by printing, giving individuals the power to store their life's work in a form no one can inflate away or confiscate. The journey from gold to fiat to Bitcoin is a story that's still being written. The world is waking up to the consequences of the fiat experiment and the search for an alternative is on. To understand where we're going next and to follow the most important economic story of our lifetime, subscribe for more.
For millennia, gold served humanity well as honest, stable money. But its one fatal flaw, its physicality, required it to be centralized, creating a vulnerability that governments exploited to take control and plunge the world into the age of fiat currency. The last 50 plus years have been a chaotic experiment in money without an anchor, defined by inflation, debt, and instability. But history shows us that money evolves. It's a technology, and it can be improved. Bitcoin is not an attack on gold, it is its digital successor. It takes the timeless principles of scarcity and proof of work that made gold valuable and combines them with a decentralized digital network. It solves the problem of trust by removing the need for it. It offers absolute scarcity in a world of infinite printing. It provides a way to save and transact value that is sovereign, censorship resistant, and global. We are in the early stages of a profound shift. The transition from one monetary standard to another is never smooth, but the direction of travel is becoming clear. Bitcoin represents a return to the principles of sound money reimagined for the digital age. It's a vote for a future where money is governed by transparent rules instead of fallible rulers, and where individuals, not institutions, are in control of their own financial destiny.